it's not in Disney territory to hear anyone that due to First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Red River. Um, and the territory was the subject of the fish with one spoon, uh, one cooked milk columns. Um, and as I found out, uh, I moved here not too long ago, dish with one spoon is used to refer to the stewardship of shared territories and hunting grounds and the collective responsibility to ensure that there is always enough game and fish uh, to eat for all. So it was really like a, a collective agreement on resources as well, which I think is generally relevant to the context of this conversation. Um, so today, the unique place of Toronto is still home to many indigenous people from across the Carolina. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work with me on this territory. Um, with that, I'll hand over to Yinchen, who's going to do some awesome mapping for us. Hi, I'm Yinchen. Welcome to the second day of the workshop. So if you are not here on the first day, this is a QR code you can scan to, to ask any questions for, in the following hours in the day or any suggestions you want to suggest the agenda like uh, what should we discuss or something. And uh, uh, our digital minister Audrey will answer the questions some later in the afternoon. So you can scan the ears and the QR code or go to slido.com and enter the code uh, uh, 1106 Toronto. And you can up here find a, a hack folder that looks like You look at this, where you can help to type the crowd notes of our jury and all the yesterday documentation and uh, today's materials in this text folder you can use later. So now I want to uh, take us. Okay. Um, just to add, so we are having slight continued Wi-Fi limitations. I've temporarily put on my hotspot is Alex and lowercase civic tech is the password. If we could have at least one person on the table to sort of like take a look at an more initiative to crowdsource notes, I think it'd be helpful for everybody. Um, so if we could make sure that somebody's connected, if you additionally need hotspots, if people are able to jump in, we would we'll be really grateful for that. Uh, very happy to reinforce for any cost to her. Okay, so I want to, some of you, uh, since I saw you not here yesterday, I'll go back uh, to see the, the things we do. Yesterday, you can see all the poster we have. So it's a for issue mapping, and this tool is a tool I'm developing to help to bring the uh, uh, the process discussion online, so that we can see what we're doing. So, so you can see right here. Uh, this is based on the group I'm participating in. So yesterday, first we we collect a lot of problems that we think uh, Uber has or. Uh, what Uber is trying to solve, and then we categorize it. So, like in this tool, I can. Oh, there's no. Sorry. I can group. I can group several problems into one box, and like ride sharing is too expensive, which means it's changing public transit quality. And then go back here and see. Um, there's this con congestion issue emerging from broken transit system, a new mobility model, and driver working conditions, and the safety issue. Those are the five problems that, after we categorize our discussion. And then based on the, the problems we found, we start the how might we challenge. So, um, uh, yeah, there's a problem here. So my group, like we have like around three how might we challenge. So I just going to introduce one of these. So I, we, I can add a, add a line here. So this is how might we how might we address transportation needs from a system-wide perspective So when we see a Uber issue. And then yesterday, uh, found right access to, to throw up, here are some possible solutions. So we throw up some solutions like for congestion, enhance public transportation and business strategy. And all these solutions, we all add some risk and risk on the like tough to ship behavior change and need political well. And then we go up, go on, continue to go on to have the final three solutions we come together. And by mapping this, you can see this solution actually come from nowhere. From the from the lab. So when you when you do actually do the mapping, you can see the relationship 
why why are we talking about bike sharing system and suddenly this part just turned out as a motorbike. We we need to change the insurance of the motorbike. And then Conrad asks people to write the responsible bodies. So actually, if you can do it more detail, you can link the responsible bodies to the solutions. Like the solution, those are the final three solutions we want. And like increasing investment in public transit and infrastructure need about three different levels of government to all work together. And then finally, uh, Conrad has uh, asked uh, people what to major success in the method. So this is my group listing like that. So by uh, using some digital like this, it's called sense.tw. We want to make sense.tw. And the interface is English, so in your, if you're interested in using your tool, you can approach to me, or you can try it out to document uh, your discussion online. So if you take a larger picture like this, so you can see how uh, come from the original problems, and go through the solution we have and the threats and the final solution and who is the responsible body. And you can definitely see that there's a problem and a challenge statement and no solutions over here because we don't have time yesterday. So using an online tool allows you to add more comments after uh, offline meeting. And this is the tool I'm developing and you're welcome to use other online tours like Man map or real-time board so to, to save your offline discussion. So that's a quick reflection of what we did yesterday. And uh, next is, okay. So, so just to clarify, this is what you're showing us here. This is a tool you're developing? Yeah, and it's open source. So if you want to make a modification, you can just fork it. That's, that's, that's really cool. Okay, thank you. Does that tool, if you want it to generate any kind of report or like spreadsheet that has all of the information that you've typed in, does it um, produce anything that you might be able to like reuse it or like like explore as in CSV file? Or something? Yeah. So far. If you want to code, if you want to run it through something to like code different feedback or. So far, no, but we use in our product that will. Yeah, so are we going to do we have to use the user anymore? Um, do we have time more? Yeah. It's okay. No. Yeah. Okay. Then any other questions? Do someone have a Yes. Are you using him? No? So uh, oh. the see send stuff T W seems to have no comment on it. Also, did you did you write it with React? Yeah. Yes, and it, the mobile version is very poor right now. We are working on a mobile version. So if you're opening from your cell phone right now, it looks very ugly. So Yeah, it's sense.tw. And the mobile version just sucks. <laughs> That's, yeah. So it's, it's open source, it's beta, so yeah. We are working on that. So you can give me some feedback so I can work on the mobile version. That's 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 the my team are developing this spring. So I ready for here to gather you some feedback. Okay. Thank you. Also, uh, we have additional hotspots set up. Um, it should be PDS workshop and the password is workshop in lowercase. Uh, and we're gonna proceed to some presentations because. Uh, PDS is doing all these like super cool things, but also in the local context, uh, Toronto um, and the city, uh, the city of Toronto and also uh, the Ontario government have been up to initiatives that are just a school and uh, thought it would be wonderful to make an opportunity to hear more about it. Um, we're going to uh, start with... Since the is up, yeah, if you guys can come out here. Yeah, I think that's the So Tess, uh, I'm actually just going to head over to... Hi everyone, um, if we didn't get a chance to meet yesterday, my name is Tess. I'm with the Toronto Center for Active Transportation. Um, and I'm going to share with you today a little bit about the program I manage, which is called Active Neighborhoods Canada. And it is a participatory urban planning um, program. So we work really in, the, in physical spaces in the built environment to engage people in 
uh, creative ways of solving both environment challenges. Um, oh, whoops. Okay. It's too cumbersome. Um, so, uh, TCAP is a project of the registered charity Clean Air Partnership. Um, and our mission is to advance knowledge and evidence to build support for safe and inclusive streets for walking and cycling. Um, the program that I work on specifically is called Active Neighborhoods Canada. And as I mentioned, it's a participatory urban planning program. So this program is federally funded. It's Public Health Agency of Canada funded. And to give you a little bit of background or history, um, it started with our partner in Quebec, the Montreal Urban Ecology Center, and they developed this uh, participatory planning approach uh, that worked really well to engage citizens in the planning process in Montreal, but Montreal, if you know anything about that city, has a very specific municipal context as a borough structure. Um, and so they were curious to see how this approach would play out across Canada in different political and social and geographic contexts. Um, so in, oh I can't, I think maybe 2011, um, they brought on board TCAT as well as another organization in Calgary, the Sustainable Calgary Society, to uh, try out this approach in 12 different communities across Canada over the course of four years. Um, after that pilot approach, uh, we received an additional phase of funding to focus more intensively in one community each um, for the next three years. And we're actually working um, in Peterborough with an organization called Green Up, um, and that was a result of one of the pilot projects. Um, so what is our approach? What does it look like? Um, it starts with some principles of co-design. The first principle is that residents are experts. Um, people that are moving through, living in, traveling, and working and living in these spaces really do know what works best for them. Um, and that expertise is very valuable. Um, the second kind of principle of co-design is that participation builds equity. Um, the way that people are invited in to participate in planning processes currently um, really leaves out certain voices and so certain populations or modes of transportation are marginalized in the process resulting in a built environment that further marginalizes those folks. Um, and we have a focus on health equity specifically. Um, we also believe that planning can be fun. It doesn't have to be a dry kind of like city hall consultation style event. Um, combining knowledge creates strong outcomes. So residents are experts, but there's also lots of disciplines that kind of interface with the built environment, like planning, transportation, architecture, urban design, public health. Um, so bringing together all of those knowledge sets is what you need to create strong outcomes. Um, collaboration is key. So not just having different interprofessional voices, but actually collaborating across, you know, public, private, not-for-profit sector, community groups, and uh, creating solid partnerships. And the community plans that result from our process are living documents, so they're not necessarily um, a plan that has a you know very specific schedule to implement it, but it helps communities to articulate their vision for their neighborhood and um, come up with actions in short, medium, and, and long term to start to create changes to the built environment. We do this through a three-stage process. The first step we call the portrait phase, and this is really, we do tons of broad-based resident outreach in this phase. Um, and the goal is to understand the neighborhood's assets and what, where there might be infrastructure gaps. So we combine that resident knowledge with secondary data, like census and transportation surveys, to create a diagnostic kind of portrait of the neighborhood. You can explore some of those on our website, which I'll give you later. Then we move into a vision phase, which is where we start to bring in some of those professional knowledge sets to work together in co-design workshops with residents to come up with a vision. And then the plan stage is creating some actions to try to incrementally achieve that vision. Um, I kind of already covered this piece about combining knowledge, um, but just recognizing that residents, are their expertise is just as valuable, if not more, than you know who we might call experts. Um, we try to build equity in the engagement process um, by reaching out to people that are typically not included. We do lots of like, pop-up events. We operate very much in a physical space, so part of why I'm interested in this workshop in particular is how to move some of this into a digital space too. Um, so we work with lots of like children and youth, new Canadians, we go to seniors' homes, uh, we spend just a lot of time out on the ground in communities. Um, I don't have time, so I won't go through the community stories really, but I just wanted to give you a bit of the diversity of the geographic contexts we've worked in. 
So Thorncliffe Park and Flemington Park in Toronto, uh, the Stewart Street neighborhood in Peterborough. Um, each of our partners worked rurally in one area, so we worked in Haliburton Village in Haliburton County, uh, the Donovan neighborhood in Sudbury, and now we're working, as I said, for the next couple of years in Peterborough in three different neighborhoods. We've started in a neighborhood called Jackson Park, Brookdale, and um, a neighborhood called Downtown Jackson Creek. So you can um, learn about each of those communities and you can also um, learn about our tools for co-design um, on our website, which is participatoryplanning.ca. Um, on there we have a toolbox, so on the tools tab, um, that has, um, right now it has roughly 30, we're always adding to it, um, different engagement tools to involve citizens in discussions about uh, built environment. They can also, many of them apply to other um, types of participation and engagement too. And then in the page called In the Field is where there's a map where you can uh, learn about each of those communities, check out the portraits and the plans if, if the plan exists already, some are underway. Um, and yeah, feel free to ask me any questions. It's, um, uh, it, it's an intersection that I'd say that we're trying to foster more um, in, in Toronto and in Canada through um, initiatives and groups and communities like, like Civic Tech Toronto. So um, uh, I'll say, I guess, you know, just, I, I don't want to go into too long, but I just want to say a little bit about kind of how, how uh, Civic Tech Toronto came to be. Um, about three and a half years ago, uh, there were a few of us who, who became aware of the civic tech communities that were growing in the U.S. Um, and elsewhere um, that were uh, supported by nonprofits like Code for America. Um, and in particular, there were some really active community groups in cities like Chicago and New York and Oakland. Um, and we, so we were excited about, you know, around that connection between um, technology, design, data, and, and community organizing. Um, bringing these folks together, who, who often um, aren't aren't in the same room, to be working to, to be rolling up their sleeves and working on working together on addressing civic issues. And so we, um, uh, you know, based on that, and specifically inspired by the the work, the community work that was happening in Chicago through groups like Try Hack Night, we uh, we decided to start something to start something similar in Toronto. So we started Civic Tech Toronto, running weekly hack nights every Tuesday evening, and it's meant to be a, a very welcoming space um, for people of, of, uh, who, who are not only technologists, but for people who are interested in technology and design and in the roles that those, um, that those methods and tools can potentially play in, um, in addressing civic issues. 
So, and the format is, it's different from other kinds of meetups in that um, there's, a, there's a minimal amount of, of kind of uh, talking with the whole room, and as much as possible, we, uh, we, we use our time for actually splitting up into smaller teams and working on specific projects. So, uh, if you haven't been to a Civic Techtron Hack Night, I encourage you to. Um, and, um, and I think that it, it's, it's been really exciting to see that community grow over the past three and a half years. And I'd say that there's a really, um, that there are a growing number of collaborations that are happening. And I think that David and, or Ali and, um, and Delaney will talk about some of those collaborations that are happening now between community members and, um, uh, and folks in government and in, and in nonprofits. Um, uh, I'll step, I'll, I guess, zoom out a little bit and talk a bit about Code for Canada. And so, um, uh, Code for Canada is modeled on on the on nonprofits in other in other countries um, like Code for America, Code for Australia, Code for Germany, others. Um, and our role is to help promote the civic tech movement at a national level. And so, what that looks like is certainly supporting community organizers like those who are who, who bring together the civic tech events and and, um, and other similar events in other cities across the country. But it also, but it also is about kind of trying to find other deeper ways of developing those kinds of relationships and collaborations. And so, our uh, our biggest program at Code for Canada is called is called the Fellowship, and it's a program where we work with government partners to identify a sort of small to mid-sized challenge that they're facing, and then we hire um, digital experts, so uh, uh, software developers, UX designers, product digital product managers and we embed them into government for nine months to work alongside their colleagues in government to build a new digital government service. Um, so, so that's a way that, that over the course of full time for nine months that a team of three people can, um, can, can play an impact in both enabling a new digital service but also building the capacity of, the, of their colleagues in government so that they can um, continue to use those kinds of tools and methods on that project and others um, uh, once the fellowship's over. Um, Shay is here, uh, you may have met her, um, who is our program manager running Civic Hall of Toronto. That's another, uh, uh, one of our newest programs that's also about um, connecting uh, government innovators with the tech and design community. Um, it's a membership-based program, so if, you, uh, if you're a public servant, um, you or your team can sign up as a member of City Hall of Toronto, and, um, and that can be a great way of enabling some learning and collaboration with folks in the city tech community, if, uh, if that's something that sounds like it would be of interest to you. So. Um, and maybe I'll leave it there and pass it over to, um, to Ollie. And sure. Yeah, great. Right. Thank Uh, yeah, so I'm Ali, I'm the um, product manager on Lightspace, which is one of the projects that uh, Supertech has been uh, supportive of. Um, it's been, it was initially an idea from about a year ago, um, just over a year ago now, which brought together Code Canada, the Civic Tech community, but also uh, local uh, government and form of uh, City Hall, form of Toronto uh, government, uh, which there was an issue that was recognized by the cycling community, but also by the city, uh, that bike parking across uh, Toronto was lacking in some areas, that people felt that they uh, didn't have a good dialogue with how uh, their bike parking experience was represented, uh, and that they wanted a, a better way to uh, record and report these issues that uh, didn't quite gel with some of the options that were available. And also a request from the city that I think they wanted a, a new way of kind of collecting data and insight into this, but in a way that didn't feel um, top down, didn't feel like the city was um, kind of just another program that they were sort of using to, to um, show that they were engaged in some format. They wanted to have a real kind of grassroots uh, process. And so this came out with the uh, outcome of this is uh, flag space, which is sort of my problems, which is sort of my problem. Um, and this was a year-long process uh, 
in collaboration between those, those kind of key partners, but driven primarily in terms of the output by community members of Civic Tech to build a web app, or app or like space.ca, please go and check it out, uh, which allows you to report and record uh, bike parking issues that you find as you use bike parking across the city, whether bike parking is damaged, there's a lack of availability, uh, that there are abandoned bikes in the, uh, in the racks that you regularly use. And this data is then um, recorded and we use that information and pub publish it publicly on a dashboard, uh, which is uh, one of the links there, view the dashboard. <laughs> and, and the idea is that ultimately that this data is used uh, and is an impartial uh, user-generated crowdsourced data that can be used by both the city but also private private uh, landowners, um, you know, sort of shops, you know, if you're like the local metro or uh, no frills and you're seeing lots of bins around your area, but there seems to be problems with either a lack of parking or that your parking isn't uh, fit for purpose, that you can use that data to make a business case to improve what they're doing and store new racks, but also for the city to help them uh, understand the need, prioritise where they might want to uh, fund replacement or additional parking. Um, I think that's kind of everything about bike space, but I, I think you know there's been lots of really interesting lessons from that project around partnership, working with across both government, seeing their needs, seeing how you engage and, and, and get a group of um, volunteers really excited and committed to a project, um, and also I think uh, ensuring that you deliver something that is actually useful and used um, and kind of maintaining that energy and that push for use is also a big part of the world. Well, I'll keep this fairly short. Um, I'll be talking about Ample Labs, which is another project that um, spurred from a civic tech. Um, and one of the um, the, the reason that, that this came about, so Apple Labs is um, trying to empower um, people who are homeless through technology, and that's the broad mission, and we have several kind of projects underneath, uh, underneath that. Um, one of the main things that we started off doing was developing a chatbot to um, help people who have uh, mobile phones uh, and smartphones to be able to uh, access resources in the city, like finding a free meal or finding um, where shelters are. Um, so we actually have a, a prototype already. Um, just kind of see if we can get that loaded. So this is something that we've been working on for the past couple of months with uh, a team of developers, designers, uh, UX researchers, um, and we've done a, quite a bit of um, UX research with um, with clients at shelters as well as doing stakeholder interviews um, with um, service providers um, to to develop this chatbot. Um, and this is something um, that is um, in response to kind of the the static mobile, uh, sorry, the static website that's um, that's currently up on the city's website. There's 311, 211 that people can use to access resources. They can call a helpline using their phone. Uh, but we know that a lot of people have um, mobile phones um, and depend on mobile phones. So this is um, a much more um, human-centered way of um, accessing the resources that they need. And unfortunately, this is not connected to a GPS location, so we have to manually enter it in. Um, but if, if you were connected to, um, if you had your GPS enabled, you'd be able to, uh, yeah. Okay, just, in the, just for the sake of time, um, I'll, I'll skip this, but um, it's, uh, it's quite uh, interesting and um, it's, um, 
Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, you did quite well. Um, yeah, so this is something that we're currently uh, trying to uh, go to the city of Toronto with. Uh, there was a, a lot of interest. We had an event. Um, called, uh, there was a, a Homeless Connect event where there was a lot of uh, city staff and service providers that uh, took quite a lot of interest in um, releasing this to, um, uh, to clients. Uh, we had uh, printed off. Um, some things with our, our website so that people can download um, um, the app um, and yeah so that's just want to showcase one of the things that we've been working on through Civic Tech. So thank you. Um, we'll just pass over to Ryan from Canada office. Okay, uh, so I, I'm from a central agency in the provincial government, so this will be a little bit drier, I think. Uh, but I work in an organization called the Policy Innovation Hub. Uh, sorry, one sec. This is us, uh, not the TV show, but the team. Uh, so we're an in-house resource in the cabinet office. Uh, we serve the entire OPS policy community. In a lot of ways, we help form the, the foundation or the backbone of the OPS policy community, which is about 4,000 members strong in our 60,000 plus uh, person organization. The vision that the Policy Innovation Hub, or the Hub, uh, that's, what, that's what we call it at home, um, our vision is really this OPS that creates you know, effective policy that has a sustainable impact for the people, organizations, and communities in Ontario. So we have a, a fairly inclusive definition of what it means to be an Ontarian. Uh, and our mission um, is really unique because we're a central agency and cabinet office and that we can seek out, apply, sh and share the best tools, skills, insights uh, to address the policy delivery challenges that the province faces. Um, and so, you know, getting to run in the center of government, we get to demonstrate that taking some risks uh, and, and trying something new is okay. If it's okay at the center, it can be okay on the periphery for ministries that aren't central agencies. Um, so that, that's the team and a little bit about our mission. So I mentioned we are in the cabinet office, so that's the department that reports to the, the premier that if, if you're looking for who's our minister. Um, we're in the policy and delivery division, so that's the division that anyone who knows what a cabinet submission is from the OPS, um, uh, that's where they go. They go to our division and anyone who doesn't know, basically like the documents that go into making decisions that turn into policy, they go to the, the, the lead of our division. Uh, so we work there, we work in kind of this place where decisions are made and kind of long-term and short-term thinking gets done and that's where we find ourselves. So the hub has two main areas. One is knowledge mobilization and capacity building. So that's an organization that's, that's existed in the hub for a little while. It's that backbone organization for the policy community. Um, the new part of the Policy Innovation Hub is the Projects and Consulting Team. And that's the, the team that I lead um, uh, and, and have been leading since September 2017. Um, and so what we do uh, is this. This is our model. So we have three main kind of practice areas uh, in our consulting model. So uh, we're this hands-on, very important free support uh, for ministries within the, the Ontario Public Service to really help them kind of tackle their problems in new ways. Um, and so, you know, our our focus is uh, on ensuring that we find the right problems, we come up with the right kinds of solutions to address those problems, and to really maximize the value for taxpayers. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's kind of where we come at it. And how we do that is by really focusing on this human-centered design element uh, that we talked a, a lot about yesterday and, and will uh, later today. And so we practice that in three main areas. So first is service design. So you know we have a lot of government services and programs. How do we design them for humans um, and the people using them, and less about the organizations that are delivering them? Which you know is not just something that ha happens in the public service, banking, any big organization. Often a lot of what it does is centered around what it does well as an organization, and you know a lot of them are shifting to their, their clients, your customers, your users. So we have a service design practice. We also have a systemic design practice, which is 
Uh, long story short, just the blending of design thinking and systems thinking that helps our team zoom in and out of complex problems. Uh, whether it's policy, legislation, and regulation, or the kind of uh, the organizational design that's required to change the way we work to do the things that we want to accomplish better. And then our last practice area is strategy and strategic foresight. This is really about helping ministries build robust strategies uh, for the future, especially given the rate of change and the uncertainty that we face. So those, those are our practice areas. Um, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit on our service design practice. So this is how we get things done. Um, you know, we do some user research, we co-design, we prototype and test. Sometimes that prototyping and testing is with our ministry clients. Sometimes we get to do that with, with users, but for the most part, it, it, is on, it is on the ministry side. And then uh, really importantly, we implement uh, and measure impact to make sure that you know, what, we're, what we're suggesting you know, does have that sustainable and effective impact for Ontarians. And so I'll, I'll just give you one example of a service design project that we've done, just to, to show you I'm, I'm not full of shit. Um, so uh, here is a project that we're working on with the Family Responsibility Office. Uh, so the Family Responsibility Office uh, is responsible for, it affects 380,000 Ontarians every year. Uh, and it really is about making sure that people who owe child support or spousal support are have their payments connected to the people receiving it. Um, and it was, we found that it was one of the most complained about areas of government to the ombudsman. Um, it had, you know, this long history of people in, interacting with the service, you know, feeling like they weren't getting the most out of it, and a sore spot for government. And we, what we found was a really dedicated team in that office that was committed to change. They just needed a few extra tools to do it. So we brought our service design practice with them. Um, I won't take a lot of credit for it. Um, I, I'm the, the lead of the team, but uh, my colleague, Marie Serrano, who isn't here today, did the majority of the work with the ministry. Um, and a special shout out to the Behavioral Insights Unit too, uh, in, the, in the OPS, who, who also helped with some of the material that we developed. Essentially what we did was we looked at the, the services that um, the, these FRO, or Family Responsibility Office, uh, payers and recipients were experiencing. And we tried to look at how that service might be redesigned. So uh, there's a proof of concept team uh, that put together this proof of concept where uh, they divided people entering the, the program into three main tiers based on their ability and willingness to pay and sort of this mix of um, you know how well they would, they would be able to work with the program as well as the compliance with what the, the program required. Uh, and so, you know, we worked with them to look at the three different tiers to develop journey maps uh, and really try to focus more um, on this, this culture and spirit of service rather than compliance, which is where a lot of government programs come from. They come from, you know, compliance and enforcement. And we wanted to focus more on, on service and kind of helping people solve problems and navigate what can sometimes be a confusing system. We've worked with a team um, of really de dedicated public servants to develop lots of prototypes, um, and that kind of exemplify the experience that people are, are going through, but also the tools that can make that experience better. Um, really importantly, we've tested a lot of this stuff with management and executive to get that buy-in for, for the kind of change management that's required. And we've been working with the team to implement the pilot and do some early evaluation to look for warning signs uh, for things that maybe aren't working as we expected or, or, or thought would work theoretically, uh, but not in practice. So far, so good. And the proof of concept will eventually be rolled up into something that the ministry is looking to take uh, overall uh, for the entire program. So we're replacing the existing one with, with something very similar to this proof of concept, which makes a huge impact to, to 380,000 people a year. So this is just an example of some of the stuff that we've done. So we've done kind of end-to-end -end, uh, storyboards on the experience. Uh, we work on kind of these traditional sort of call center type materials, like a call flow prototype. Not everything needs to look cool to, to be innovative. Um, and that's something that we really sell clients on. Like it can look and feel a lot like what you already do. Um, and all we need to do is just bring a different perspective to it. 
And then uh, the welcome package prototype. So people entering the program uh, had a, a lot of confusion about what the program was achieving, why they might have even been in it. So um, it, if you can see the, the documents in the front on the, the far right, that's the welcome package prototype that the Behavioral Insights Unit helped us uh, develop that really tries to help the, the clients focus on the most salient information uh, because they're just more bombarded with lots of other stuff from courts and their lawyers and not to mention they're going through a pretty tumultuous period of their life because of a separation or, or a changing kind of landscape in their family. So we wanted to help them focus on what matters so they can kind of deal with other things later. So this is the very, in the bottom left, is the very dedicated and, and fun team of kind of people who were in the ministry uh, that got put together because they were they showed this like great character of wanting change and being able to affect change. We've done a lot of different kinds of workshops and online kind of collaboration to really get at the heart of these problems. And we've used a ton of tools like storyboards, journey maps, empathy maps, um, prototypes of pieces of paper that the government has to send people on how we can make them better. Uh, and we've done a lot of really, really cool work with the, with the team uh, to, to make sure that we're, that we're making a lasting impact um, and really trying to find that, that value for money in, in, uh, in the province for taxpayers. So that's, that's one case study. Um, we have lots of other things that are on our internet that is not accessible to about half the people in the room. Um, but I think we're hoping to have more of a public presence uh, and you know, we'll, we'll, we can share this material here. If you'd like to know more about what the Hub does, you can uh, email our shared inbox at policyinnovation at ontario.ca or me. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you can sign up for our newsletter as an external organization, but uh, we'll see what we can do if you're interested. So that's it. Thanks. We are going to uh, have the questions for like, throughout the break period. Okay. Um, and also, as Ryan mentioned, I believe uh, Leanne is here from the Rome Insights Unit as well. So if you guys have questions for any of these amazing folks, uh, the work that they do, um, we also have our government office, uh, people really work, working on like, a really cool uh, climate budget, the press from TO, from the energy as well. Um, but yeah, cool folks on the room, so please do uh, you know, exchange uh, your work and projects. Uh, we're gonna have a bus and a few speed time one day, uh, crowdsource registration day. Hello, um, hi, it's a great pleasure. Um, I'm Evros, uh, I'm a legal consultant with PDs, and today this is the Vita one day. So after we learn from Fawn uh, the surface design and uh, the methods and uh, physical tools that we help facilitation. Uh, but today Vita one is just another um, method of uh, enhancing uh, facilitation. And as the subtitle I put. How did democracy go from offline to an offline? And on offline, it's just a an HTML attribute. It's one of the HTML attributes. But I, I didn't plan to borrow the, term, the definition of the term. I just like the combination of online and offline because we try to uh, use different kinds of tools, especially uh, online tools like open source, to help to mix the physical and virtual space. So it's kind of like a mixed reality. And uh, yeah, just in, in terms of uh, public participation. And the trigger, so last uh, yesterday, Audrey has asked if uh, some of you might not have heard of a Soundflower movement, and it was around 50-50, but I guess now it's 100%. So now it's a uh, Soundflower movement is Oh, but that is the trigger of Vitao One, and that's when a Vitao was born. And just so you know, so here's just some quick facts about uh, some kind of movement. Uh, it's an Occupy Holland movement, and uh, it raised the awareness, just many uh, raised the awareness of open source communities, communities and citizen participation. So that's when um, public participation became 
like a widespread notion across the island nation of Taiwan. And so this ha happened from March 18 to April, uh, April 10, so it lasted for 23 days. And in the same year, uh, then Minister with our portfolio, Jacqueline Tsai, uh, she went to join a, a, mini, a hackathon held by GovZero, and she went to the hackathon and proposed that we, sh we need a platform to allow the entire society to engage rational discussion. So that's uh, when uh, Tom was born. And as I heard, because uh, I wasn't involved with the, the very beginning of Taiwan, but as I heard, uh, it took around two weeks to set up the website. So uh, at the end of 2014, Vita was born, and since 2015, there has been there have been 25 cases discussed through the Vita process. Okay. So that's just a brief just, just introduction of the Taiwan, and I'm going to talk about the future and the culture of the Taiwan. And this is um, a book that has inspired me a lot, written by Cass Arsonsky, a, a Harvard Law professor. I guess it's also one of the most cited uh, law professor. Uh, he said, many people are mostly hearing more and louder echoes of their own voices. So this just reminds me of what Facebook is. Because every day we uh, go on, to, uh, we use Facebook and the daily feeds that because mostly it's about the, the page that you subscribe to, or the friends and family that you follow. So um, the longer you stay, or a watch or view a, a specific field of friends or families or other pages, um, the more it feeds you with the similar stories. So uh, at the end, you will mostly all fall into like a, a like an echo chamber. So it's like a virtual space that uh, mm, that limits your um, randomness to other kind of world. And also, he said, your judgment appears to be a product of your values and identity. And this, uh, I think, I find it quite interesting because um, Avi Taiwan will have lots of chances to read other, peop other people's opinions or comments online. So even if one uh, individual tries to stay anonymous, but you can still tell where or like what class or what kind of uh, social status or uh, financial status or situation that individual belongs to. So it's uh, sometimes it's quite easy to tell uh, who is the individual behind the screen just by reading uh, the values or the, the comments that the individual posts online. And uh, this is, uh, like the core spirit of uh, Taiwan, autonomy and empowerment. And we have several ways to exercise, to realize autonomy and try to empower people uh, by consensus-based process and participant-oriented agenda, rolling correction, open format, and no strict rules. So these are the principles that we try to stick to throughout the Taiwan process. Uh, and I'll show you uh, my following slides how we do this. So, to, so the, the, um, the main value is to uh, encourage people to stay autonomous and empower them to speak up for themselves. And autocracy is, um, is also a, a main value uh, to support the entire process. Uh, it's uh, a term that's the opposite of bureaucracy, which means a system of flexible and informal organization and management. So this is um, another way we, when we int uh, introduce the Taiwan, we use this term to, to share our value. And there are the critical roles that will help support throughout the whole VTAR process. And just another reminder that because no one can represent the Taiwan, we have this nobody culture. Uh, as Gov Zero community. So nobody can represent me Taiwan, and this is just my way to 
introduce it, and uh, there are many ways and many perceptions that you can hold to look what talent is, and this is just my perception. And I, um, I think here are the three critical rules uh, for the Taiwan to, to go, to go on. And there are facilitator, uh, editors, and contributors. And the facilitator has to be knowledgeable about the issue. So if there's a specific issue, then uh, the facilitator will, be, uh, will take on those that this that specific issue. Then he or she or uh, has to be knowledgeable about that issue and should participate throughout the whole process of the Taiwan and have holding uh, neutral ground and with no direct interest and familiar with um, uh, or I that this is one of the facilitation method that we uh, that we carry and editors uh, have to be capable capable of maintaining the websites like having like the basic knowledge like ABC basic knowledge of running uh, or using the HTML that kind of coding and uh, has to be responsible and active in the town community and have to be uh, regular participants of mini hackathons on Wednesdays. So we, we do this on a weekly uh, basis. And contributors, uh, anyone can be contributors, uh, just some basic manners that he or she have to behave themselves, uh, and they have to be honest with themselves. So they are, these are the critical rules uh, that have to support the Taiwan process. And here are the pictures of our usual uh, mini hackathon on each Wednesday. Uh, as you can see here, uh, Audrey is the most regular participant of mini hackathon, and there are other and also our colleague PDs and some sometimes the uh, public sectors like the uh, National Development Council will also join us. And the process. And just so you know, this is just my way to describe it. Uh, and four stages are uh, the consensus that we reach when we try uh, when we want to introduce B Taiwan to the world. But other people might think there are another way to put, to describe it. So maybe there can be five stages or less than four stages. But uh, four stages are uh, both are mainly the, the uh, consensus that most of the contributors agree to agree with. And so here are the four stages: the proposal, opinion, reflection, and legislation or regulation. So as I heard yesterday, Andre also I call it uh, rectification and ratification. So there are some different terms to describe uh, these stages. And so, but as I said, the rough consensus is that there are four stages. And to, so proposal stages to, for contributors to propose and to submit a topic, including the one that Fong had mentioned, like if there's an event, uh, it includes noticing a specific controversy, and then uh, some of the contributors or one of the contributors might propose on the pro at the proposal stage. And then at the opinion stage, uh, we have who will hold online opinion collection, and this is when uh, we um, use like polls or discourse that kind of uh, online tools to help collect opinions from the general public. In our reflection stage, we hold a uh, consultation meeting, and the key feature is that we put in a live stream. So that's uh, where the physical and virtual space combine and uh, combine together. Yeah, and just to ensure every every voice be heard. So throughout the whole process, we will have mini hackathons on each Wednesday, and it's a uh, on a weekly basis. And also, if there's an extra need for discussion, then we will have occasional internal meetings throughout these four stages. And here is just a uh, visualization of mm, the idea of flows, of how these ideas will diverge and converge throughout the four stages. So at, 
at the start. Um, it might be quite diverged, and then we somehow try to let them converge. And then maybe at the opinion stage, because we have collected so many opinions from the general public, so it might diverge a little bit. But then we try to um, let it converge. So it's a gradual process throughout the four stages. And um, there's another uh, feature that's called, or probably called the rolling basis, and, and also a, a term which is called a recursive public. A recursive public is a public that is highly concerned um, about the maintenance or the modification of like legal or economic or technical the means of its existence. So it, um, it's cited from a, a professor, I don't know which, which field, but uh, it's a, like an academic term. And you, so, just simply put, it means um, the, contribu the contributors can decide their own rules and also on a rolling basis. So if we find the re at the reflection stage, the ideas diverge too much, and then we go back to the opinion stage and try to uh, find a convergence of the ideas. So uh, it's a repeating, it, it can also be repeated. And so, and uh, at the end, the goal is to find a rough, reach the rough, rough consensus among the contributors. And uh, here are some case studies, and I have two cases, one is Uber, which is also the most popular case of the Taiwan. And also the other, another case is uh, a CII case, non-consensual intimate image, also called, also known as uh, non-consensual pornography, which means uh, non-consensual leakage of someone's um, make, naked photos. Uh, yeah, so, so it's mostly about privacy and data protection or uh, gender equality. Uh, uh, in part. So the first case is uh, UberX, and it's the first Italian case that used police, so it's like a landmark case or police, and then we will uh, have an exercise of police later and with support of the chain. And then um, UberX case gathered the highest number of votes, so it sort of like broke the record of the Taiwan. It has gathered um, 31, roughly 31,000 votes. Um, so out of curiosity, what's, yeah. what's the usual participation of the number of votes? The usual, um, like as the I case, we only collected 100 votes, overall votes, but this one is, yeah, but if the number might not look that surprising to you, because this town is a small nation, so we don't have that many people, but 31, roughly 31,000 uh, is quite, quite a wow. What's the percentage there? Just for overall context, like what's the overall uh, like population versus this? Like what's, what, what percentage is this? Can like you, you do the math? Uh, 23 million people. <laughs> I can't. Uh, Thirty-one thousand. I would say that. <laughs> Thirty-three million people. Yeah, that's the ratio. Uh, yeah. So this is the timeline of Uber X. Is someone doing the math? Point uh, zero zero one. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. No. Or in comparison to like regular government consultations, like what's the participation? Uh, maybe Audrey so, has the number. I don't have the number, but uh, in Taiwan, if it's a regular consultation process, we have different types. One is, is the public the public hearing. And the public hearing can be thousands of people or up to sometimes. So in, in usual public hearing, there will be only, only less than 20 spots that people can speak. Because if one people speak for five minutes, it's already 100 minutes past. So if you, uh, I think you should consider being one more as a larger consulting partners than mm -hmm. a whole society 
So if we can expand 20 people to speak into 30,000 people to vote, and that's a larger scale. I think the biggest difference lies in the, the way that we hold the traditional public hearings. Like, as in, a, public, a traditional public hearing is one-sided. So it's like government official keeps talking, but don't really have the feedback back, and then they won't have like an interactive discussion or dynamic interaction. But on the Taiwan, we focus more on the deliberation discussion. So uh, the number might that not <coughs> that be that high, and because if we want to have a substantial and uh, fruitful discussion, then we can also cannot have too many people in person. So, so like as for the later, uh, like the, for reflection and consultation meeting, we mostly, uh, generally we have around 20-ish uh, contributors in person, but there may, might be over hundreds of people online posting comments at the same time. So that's how we, uh, that's the emphasis of, or the fo focus of v one yeah. This is more about the liberation. And this is the timeline of Uber X case. So 2015 it was uh, when it was proposed, and then uh, we went on to online opinion collection. And uh, after around two weeks later, we held the consultation meeting. So and so over over a year. And in 2016, uh, we have the, the new rules for uh, Uber. As, a, as the result of the Taiwan, based on the Taiwan uh, discussion. And at the proposal stage, uh, we crowdsourced, um, um, it's also, as I said, we use the participant-oriented agenda, so the contributors can decide what to discuss about. So we have a topic poll at the hackathon, and here, the top one, the Uber case, uh, was the first, the top one, the top priority of the then contributors at the moment they want to discuss about. So, uh, and plus, we have a request from several government authorities, because at the moment, Uber was quite a huge, it's really controversial um, in, in Taiwan. So, and there are lots of news about its legitimacy and the taxi um, drivers have went on the streets to protest. So there are lots of requests from Ministry of, like Ministry of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance, and Ministry of Transportation and Communications. They all feel the, uh, the strong need to have a real in discussion about, Intel, uh, about Uber. So that's how the topic was decided at that moment. And there, here are the stats. Uh, we have 145 statements on polis and 925 participants and 35, uh, 31,000 votes. And here's the visualization of a polis survey. Here you can see uh, there are group A and group B. So roughly 320 versus 883. Uh, so this poll is uh, like machine learning open source tool. It will help uh, to cluster people into groups and to get a clear view on um, how the idea uh, should be visualized as a groups. And so you can see here is the screenshot. And uh, these are the majority opinions of group A and group B. And the, the, the rough consensus, like 93% of the whole participants, that's in the color red, red or pink, rides of the right, drivers in the passenger both matter. So safety is the top priority. So as you can see, um, both sides, the group A and group B, all believe that and all concern most about uh, safety of the driver and the passengers. So 
So uh, the police survey, uh, the report generated on the backstage will tell you uh, the majority group and uh, the majority opinions of each group. Uh, so, and here are the suggestions from the majority that we interpreted from the report of police survey. So uh, it says the government should have a fair regulation of transportation and addressing the tax issue and also um, so Uber rights should follow the rules of taxi, disclosing the license and registration information on the vehicles and should be highly regulated in the same way as food and drugs are. Uber X should be registered and have mandatory insurance. So here are the four aspects um, interpreted by the facilitator of Uber case based on the reports generated on the police survey. And here is the is how we hold a held consultation meeting in 2015. So you can see uh, from the left hand side, other side, we have the ministries. So public official will sit will sit at the left hand side of the facilitator, and the facilitator will sit at the bottom of the U shape. And we have legal uh, as experts and professors sitting at the left uh, side, also at, uh, of the facilitator, and the right upper hand are the contributors, community contributors, and those who have uh, contributed their own opinions on the survey. Because those who have contributed will receive, uh, will receive the information later, letters, so they got the tickets once you contributed their own opinions, and then they can receive it there at, at, at the right hand side of the facilitator. And also, we invited uh, Uber company, Uber Inc., and Taiwan Taxi Inc., the, the, largest, the biggest uh, taxi company in Taiwan, and also uh, association, the nonprofit association of Taipei Taxi Founders. So this is the city plan, and you can see here, this is this was Audrey. Uh, she, at the moment, she was not the digital minister yet. She was a volunteer and contributor, a regular contributor of the Taiwan, so she played uh, the role of facilitator. And we use Lighthouse in a live stream platform to live stream this uh, consultation meeting. And uh, so at the legislation stage, there is the timeline, the Ministry of Transportation and Communication, they uh, took the responsibility of ratifying, so this is why one of the reasons why Audrey said this stage should also be called as ratification. So, because to um, use the definition of ratification to describe this stage. And, uh, yeah, so the event went into the event as follows um, uh, in 2016. So, this, the, this slide is um, uploaded on uh, headquarters, so I will go through them in details. And here's the second case, the NCI case, one consensual geography, and its key feature is that it was proposed by one of the contributors, and the contributors, and also the proposers serve as the facilitators. So, if um, Uber case can be seen as both the top down and bottom up case, but NCI case is purely a case that's bottom up. It's not from, the ministry, but not from the request of the ministry. It's from the need and uh, the need from and, and the proposal from the contributors. So it's bottom up case. And this the timeline of the NCI case. Um, and it hasn't um, gone to its way to the legislation stage. So it's still an ongoing process. And uh, so in 2017, at one of the mini hackathon, there were two statements in the proposal. So, the, uh, so this is how it was proposed in the very beginning. Uh, and here are the stats of the police survey. We also use police to collect the general, uh, collect opinion from the general public. Um, 
And here's the visualization of the police survey of this case. So the numbers weren't that high. It's you're paying uh, 57 versus 55. Yeah, we, it did have some difficulties um, encouraging people or attracting, uh, attracting online users to, to do the survey. Uh, and here is the majority of opinions of group A and group B. So um, one is, a uh, group A is, was more conservative while the group B was more liberal. Uh, by conservative and liberal, I mean, the, the, they, uh, they def try to define the definition of intimate images in different ways. And some might think the voice uh, or the sexual orientation can also be seen as a part of intimate images, while the conservative didn't think so. But the consensus, over 75% of the whole participants believe that it's a crime. The, the action of non-consensual distribution is a crime. And, um, and they, both, both, they both agree that uh, it doesn't happen to couples only, because it also happens if your computer is hacked, so, it, so it's not a uh, couple-only uh, situation. And here is the city map, map of the consultation meeting. And we only have many ministries, many ministries uh, joining the consultation meeting. National De Development Council, uh, National Communication Committee, National of, no, sorry, and Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Health and Welfare, MOE. What's MOE? Yeah, Mr. Education. Yeah. And so, thank you. And also, law professor and lawyer is sitting at the right, the left hand side of the single figure. So, um, in the in the afternoon, we'll also have a demo. So, I believe you have all collected the, you, you have your own color dots on your NANTAC. So you were separately you know, categorized into these four of five different groups of stakeholders. The fifth one is the online participants. Since, it, it, since they are not sitting in here, the new shape table, uh, we will have another group as online participants. So you can also post comments on the uh, chat room as we, did, as we do in consultation meeting. And a stakeholder should um, filter out those opi uh, opinions that they uh, that he or she think it's valuable to bring in into physical meeting room so that the online participants can contribute. To, contribute. Okay, and yeah, so this is a brief introduction of the Taiwan. I think we need to stick to the agenda. So I think we can collectively sort of like go at it with questions and are there any questions so far? Yes. Um, how did you do your outreach to the community just to make them aware that there was a consultation happening for the online uh, uh, We have we have a Utah One Facebook fan page, so we will uh, spread the news on face uh, uh, on Facebook fan page, and also uh, based our own face. Um, every time we um, we host uh, online opinion collection, uh, we will ask them if they would like to receive the letter uh, of the Taiwan event. So we constantly have collected a list of um, people who are interested in the Taiwan process. So we, every time we have a new event, then we will send invitation to by email and also by Facebook fan page. But it, uh, the numbers were aren't high. I mean, the number of the participants and those subscribers aren't high. Yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned that you have spaces in the the in-person consultation. Mm -hmm. There are spaces for uh, online contributors. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you would 
participated in the, the previous stage. Um, how are those contributors who appear in person selected? Um, we, we don't really select them because based on our own experience, like for example, if there are 100 participants, only three or four would like to join in person. Yeah. So, so as um, so here, uh, the right upper hand side, uh, that those seats are for community contributors, but roughly there are only like three to five people who are really willing to be, because once they join the in-person uh, consultation meeting, they will show their face. That's probably one of the concerns of why they prefer to choose to participate by uh, via the internet, yeah, so they can stay anonymous, especially in the TI case. Maybe the victims and the actors uh, will be, uh, they are will be more willing to join on the internet. So you haven't had troubles with more people wanting to come than you've been able to um, accommodate? Yeah, no, but there are actually uh, the problem lies in uh, those who haven't have contributed to the previous stage, but they would like to show, uh, they, they would like to uh, show, uh, be present in the consultation meeting. But because our rule is that uh, you have to have contributed so that you can get a ticket to sit in the table. Uh, so um, we will only let them sit by the wall and they will not be on um, live stream, so the online participants will not see those who haven't contributed before. Uh -huh. Yes? Uh, the two polos examples you showed had two groupings. Does polos ever make more than two with A and B group? Uh, it means specifically a case order, in general speaking. Yeah, like when it, when it pairs sentiments, is yeah. it always two groups? No, or? no, there are more than Yeah, it depends on the uh, the idea of flower of opinion, yes. Because um, um, I mean, the traditional online questionnaire focuses on the number of specific options or specific choices, but in Polis, the feature is that it try to emphasize. Uh, on the variety of commented opinions. So as Audrey uh, has explained yesterday, um, the more diverse um, the comments, um, the more interesting the visualization of police will look like. So maybe, because we will have a trial on police later, so if you guys post uh, like on um, various and really diverse comments, and then you can see where you where com your your comments will fall into. Yeah. So uh, they will do that exercise. Okay. Uh, so do you guys need a coffee break, or I'll go on to this for the stage one. Oh, so, sorry. Just in answer to your question, the uh, the capacity of policy itself. Um, you can break people into four to five groups, so not just by the way. Uh, yeah. and, but, so I know in some cases, uh, the group merge over the discussion. Mm -hmm. So at first maybe four or five groups, but when discussion goes on, sometimes it will merge into two groups. Yeah. And, uh, I, I also want to respond to Alex's earlier question that how Yes, the 30,000 30, doesn't sound a lot compared to the whole nation population. But I want to address one thing is that Vita One is added for this state, special for digital regulation, which means uh, it focuses on like the, the image, the, the regulation of drone, the blockchain, or the uh, company laws, something like that. It's not that like discussed the whole social welfare or the whole transportation system. So it's focused on the digital issue so far as an experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's coffee break. Uh, 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. coffee break, 10 minutes. Uh, and just remember to, if you guys had any questions, I think I saw a couple, and please pick those up. Thank you.